Welcome. In today's video, we'll explore the cunning strategies used by screw tape in C.S. Lewis's The Screw Tape Letters to lead humans astray from their spiritual path. Discover how this veteran demon manipulates thoughts, emotions, and decisions to weaken faith. Let's get started. Letter 1. My dear Wormwood, I note what you say about guiding our patient's reading and ensuring he spends ample time with his materialist friend. But are you not being a tad naive? It seems as though you believe that argumentation is the way to keep him out of the enemy's grasp. That might have been effective if he lived a few centuries ago. During that time, humans still had a firm grasp on what was proven and what wasn't. And if something was proven, they genuinely believed it. They still associated thought with action and were willing to change their way of life based on reasoned argumentation. However, with the advent of the weekly press and other such influences, we have largely altered that dynamic. Your man has been accustomed, since childhood, to entertain a multitude of conflicting philosophies in his mind. He doesn't view doctrines as inherently true or false, but rather as academic or practical, outdated or modern, conventional or radical. Jargon, not argument, is your best tool in keeping him away from the church. Don't waste time trying to convince him that materialism is true. Convince him instead that it is strong or stark or courageous, that it represents the future of philosophy. That's what he cares about. The problem with argumentation is that it shifts the entire struggle onto the enemy's turf. He can argue too, whereas in the type of practical propaganda I am suggesting, he has been proven for centuries to be greatly inferior to our father below. By engaging in argumentation, you awaken the patient's reason. And once it's awakened, who can predict the outcome? Even if a particular line of thought can be twisted in our favor, you'll find that you've reinforced in your patient the dangerous habit of focusing on universal issues and diverting his attention from immediate sensory experiences. Your goal is to fix his attention on the stream of daily life. Teach him to label it as real life and discourage him from questioning what he means by real. Remember, he's not like you, a pure spirit. Never having been human, oh, the detestable advantage of the enemy, you fail to realize how enslaved they are to the pressures of the mundane. I once had a patient, a staunch atheist, who frequented the British Museum. One day as he sat reading, I noticed his thoughts beginning to stray. The enemy, naturally, was at his side in an instant. Before I knew it, my 20 years of work were beginning to unravel. Had I panicked and tried to defend my position with arguments, I would have been defeated. But I wasn't so foolish. I immediately targeted the aspect of the man that I had the most control over and suggested that it was time for lunch. The enemy presumably countered with the suggestion, you know how one can never quite overhear what he says to them, that this matter was more pressing than lunch. At least, I believe that must have been his argument, for when I responded, exactly. In fact, far too important to address at the end of the morning, the patient visibly perked up, and by the time I added, much better to return after lunch with a fresh perspective, he was already halfway out the door. Once he hit the street, the battle was won. I showed him a newsboy shouting the noon edition and a number 73 bus passing by, and before he reached the bottom of the stairs, I had instilled in him an unshakable conviction that, regardless of the odd ideas that might come to a man's mind when he's alone with his books, a healthy dose of real life, by which he meant the bus and the newsboy, was enough to prove that all that sort of thing simply couldn't be true. He realized he'd narrowly escaped, and in later years he enjoyed discussing that inarticulate sense for actuality, which is our ultimate safeguard against the aberrations of mere logic. He's now safely ensconced in our father's house. Do you begin to see the point? Thanks to the processes we set in motion centuries ago, they find it nearly impossible to believe in the unfamiliar when the familiar is right before their eyes. Keep hammering home the ordinariness of things. And above all, refrain from using science, I mean, the actual sciences, as a defense against Christianity. It will only encourage him to ponder realities he can't touch or see. There have been unfortunate cases among the modern physicists. If he insists on delving into science, steer him toward economics and sociology. Don't let him stray from that invaluable real life. But the most effective approach is to prevent him from reading any science at all, and instead give him the impression that he's already familiar with it all, 
and that everything he's picked up from casual conversation and reading is the result of modern investigation. Remember, your task is to confuse him. Judging by the way some of you young fiends talk, one might think our job was to educate. The first letter in C.S. Lewis's discussion begins with the advice for the patient to spend time with a materialist friend, setting the stage for an exploration of materialism's challenges to Christian beliefs. This initial suggestion underpins Lewis's broader critique of modern cultural challenges to Christianity, emphasizing the foundational role of materialism in his arguments. He uses his subsequent works to illustrate various aspects of materialism's limitations and dangers. In Miracles, Lewis critiques materialism's inability to provide a rational foundation for reason, highlighting its philosophical inadequacies. In The Abolition of Man, he discusses the erosion of human dignity stemming from a materialistic disregard for beauty, suggesting a devaluation of non materialistic qualities. In The Problem of Pain, Lewis argues that materialism fails to offer a satisfying explanation for pain or a comforting prospect, contrasting it with the spiritual hope offered by Christianity. From the outset of the screw tape letters, the titular character, Screw Tapo, dismisses the use of logical argument as a means to detract the patient from God, critiquing the modern reliance on utility over truth. Screw Tape advises his pupil, Wormwood, to prioritize the appearance of strength and courage in materialism over its truthfulness, thus highlighting the strategic use of jargon over logical reasoning. Lewis contrasts this approach in his writings, showcasing his adeptness in argumentation and presenting a counter-narrative to the Enlightenment's claims. He posits that true reasoning necessitates a spiritual dimension, an insight that led him to Christianity after recognizing the insufficiency of rationalism and materialism in fully explaining the world. In the concluding remarks of the first letter, Screw Tape reflects on the enduring skepticism towards the unfamiliar, a skepticism fostered by Enlightenment principles that prioritize tangible, measurable knowledge. This irony is not lost on Lewis, who points out that even scientific knowledge relies on the unprovable assumption of an orderly and reliable world. By having Screw Tape caution against logic, Lewis confronts the cultural misconception that science and faith are inherently contradictory, advocating for a synthesis of faith and rational inquiry. Letter 2 My dear Wormwood, I note with grave displeasure that your patient has become a Christian. Do not entertain the hope that you will evade the usual penalties. Indeed, in your better moments, I trust you would hardly even wish to do so. In the interim, we must make the best of the situation. There is no need to despair. Hundreds of these adult converts have been reclaimed after a brief stint in the enemy's camp and are now with us. All the habits of the patient, both mental and physical, are still in our favor. One of our greatest allies at present is the church itself. Do not misunderstand me. I do not mean the church as we perceive her to be spread, but rather the church throughout all time and space, rooted in eternity, formidable as an army with banners. That, I confess, is a spectacle that unsettles even our boldest tempters. But fortunately, it remains entirely invisible to these humans. All your patient sees is the half-completed, ersatz Gothic structure on the new development estate. Upon entering, he encounters the local grocer, with a rather oily expression, eager to offer him one shiny little book containing a liturgy neither of them understands, and one shabby little book containing corrupted texts of numerous religious lyrics, mostly inferior and in minuscule print. As he takes his seat and surveys his surroundings, he sees only the assortment of neighbors whom he had previously avoided. It is imperative that you exert substantial pressure on those neighbors. Keep his mind oscillating between the phrase, the body of Christ, and the actual countenances in the neighboring pew. It matters very little, of course, who actually occupies that neighboring pew. Even if you know one of them to be a formidable adversary on the enemy's side, it makes no difference. Your patient, thanks to our father below, is a fool. Provided any of those neighbors sing off-key, have squeaky boots, possess double chins, or wear peculiar attire, the patient will readily conclude that their religion must therefore be absurd in some manner. At his current stage, you see, he envisions Christians in his mind as spiritual beings, although in reality his perception is largely visual. His mind is inundated with images of togas, sandals, 
armor, and bare legs, in the mere fact that the other congregants wear contemporary clothing poses a genuine, albeit unconscious, challenge to him. Never allow this issue to surface. Never permit him to ponder what he expected them to resemble. Keep everything vague in his mind for now, and you will have all of eternity to amuse yourself by instilling in him the peculiar clarity that hell provides. Therefore, labor diligently on the disappointment or letdown that is undoubtedly imminent during the patient's initial weeks as a churchgoer. The enemy permits this disillusionment to occur at the onset of every human endeavor. It arises when the boy, enchanted by tales from the Odyssey in his nursery, endeavors to genuinely learn Greek. It arises when newlyweds, enamored with each other, embark on the arduous task of cohabitation. In every facet of life, it signifies the shift from idealistic aspirations to arduous endeavors. The enemy undertakes this risk because of his peculiar fancy to transform all these contemptible human pests into what he terms his free lovers and servants. Sons is the term he employs, demonstrating his penchant for degrading the entire spiritual realm through unnatural alliances with bipedal creatures. Desiring their autonomy, he consequently refuses to transport them through their mere affections and habits to any of the objectives he sets before them. He leaves them to their own devices, and therein lies our opportunity. However, remember, therein also lies our peril. If they successfully navigate this initial dry spell, they become much less susceptible to emotional manipulation and, consequently, much more resistant to temptation. Until now, I have been assuming that the individuals in the neighboring pew present no rational grounds for disappointment. However, if they do, if the patient is aware that the woman with the absurd hat is a zealous bridge player, or that the man with the squeaky boots is a miser and extortionist, then your task becomes significantly easier. In such cases, all you need to do is prevent him from entertaining the question, if I, being what I am, can consider myself in some sense a Christian, why should the various vices of those individuals in the neighboring pew prove that their religion is mere hypocrisy and convention? You may wonder whether it is possible to prevent such an obvious thought from occurring to a human mind. It is indeed Wormwood it is. Handle him correctly, and it will never even cross his mind. He has not been in the enemy's service long enough to possess any genuine humility. Whatever he says, even when on his knees regarding his own sinfulness, is merely parroting. Ultimately, he still believes that by allowing himself to be converted, he has accrued considerable favor in the enemy's ledger and views attending church with these smug, ordinary neighbors as an act of great humility and condescension. Maintain him in this state of mind for as long as possible. In the second letter of C.S. Lewis's The Screw Tape Letters, the narrative progresses as the patient, previously at risk of converting to Christianity, has now embraced the faith. Screw Tape, however, remains undeterred reminding his fellow demons that many adult converts return to their old ways after a brief stint with Christianity. There is no need to despair. Hundreds of these adult converts have been reclaimed after a brief sojourn in the enemy's camp and are now with us. Lewis uses this development to delve into the concept of Christian conversion as more than just a momentary decision but a lifelong journey. Contrary to some theological views that regard accepting Christ as a one-time decision guaranteeing a place in heaven, Lewis emphasizes the ongoing nature of spiritual growth and struggle. He argues that conversion marks the beginning of a process of sanctification, a continuous battle against sin and a commitment to spiritual discipline that does not end until one reaches heaven. Screwtape's letters provide a dual perspective on the church. On one hand, Screwtape describes the church in disparaging terms, as a place filled with social misfits and uninspiring rituals, which mirrors Lewis's own mixed feelings about his experiences with the Anglican church. He describes his local parish as a sham Gothic erection on the new building estate and criticizes the quality of the liturgical texts and hymns. Despite his criticisms, Lewis remained a committed churchgoer, attending services at Heading Quarry and participating in the daily prayers at Magdalen College, Oxford. This commitment reflects his belief in the spiritual essence of the church, transcending its earthly imperfections. Moreover, Screwtape offers a grudging acknowledgement of the church's spiritual power, describing it as 
spread out through all time and space and rooted in eternity, terrible as an army with banners. This description underscores the formidable spiritual presence and historical continuity of the Church, aspects that Lewis revered. The letter also touches on Lewis's broader spiritual philosophy, as articulated in Mere Christianity. He proposes that God uses life's difficulties to strengthen our moral and spiritual resolve, encouraging choices based on righteousness rather than mere feelings. Screwtape, distorting this idea, claims that God does not allow mere affection and habit to dictate spiritual progress, which aligns with Lewis's emphasis on conscious and deliberate faith. Through this letter, Lewis illustrates the complexities of faith, the imperfect yet spiritually essential nature of the Church, and the ongoing challenges faced by believers in their journey toward sanctification. Letter 3. My dear Wormwood, I am exceedingly pleased with the information you've shared regarding this man's relationship with his mother. However, you must capitalize on this advantage. The enemy will be working from the center outward, gradually bringing more and more of the patient's behavior under the new standard, and may soon reach his conduct towards the old lady. You must act preemptively. Maintain close contact with our colleague Glubos, who oversees the mother, and cultivate within that household a firm habit of mutual annoyance. Daily irritations. The following methods are effective. Keep his focus on the inner life. He perceives his conversion as an internal affair. Thus his attention is primarily directed towards the states of his own mind, or rather, towards that sanitized version of them, which you should allow him to see. Foster this. Divert his attention from basic duties towards advanced and spiritual ones. Exacerbate that most useful human trait, the aversion and neglect of the obvious. You must bring him to a state where he can engage in self-examination for an hour without discovering any of those truths about himself which are glaringly obvious to anyone who has lived in the same household or worked in the same office. It is undoubtedly impossible to prevent him from praying for his mother, but we have methods to render those prayers harmless. Ensure they are always very spiritual, that he is perpetually concerned with the state of her soul and never with her physical ailments. This serves two purposes. Firstly, it keeps his attention fixed on what he perceives as her sins, which with a little guidance from you, can be made to mean any of her actions that inconvenience or irritate him. Thus you can exacerbate the wounds of the day, even while he is on his knees. The process is not at all challenging, and you will find it quite entertaining. Secondly, since his notions about her soul will be crude and often erroneous, he will to some extent be praying for an imaginary person, and it will be your task to gradually make that imaginary person less and less like the real mother, the sharp-tongued old lady at the breakfast table. In due time, you may create such a divide that no thoughts or feelings from his prayers for the imagined mother will ever influence his treatment of the real one. I've had patients so well manipulated that they could swiftly transition from fervent prayers for a spouse or child's soul to verbally or physically abusing the real spouse or child without any sense of remorse. After living together for many years, two humans often develop tones of voice and facial expressions that are nearly unbearable to each other. Exploit this. Make your patient acutely aware of that specific lift of his mother's eyebrows that he detested in his childhood and encourage him to dwell on how much he despises it. Let him assume that she knows how aggravating it is and does it deliberately to annoy him. If you're proficient at your job, he won't notice the enormous improbability of this assumption. And naturally, never let him suspect that he also has tones and expressions that similarly irritate her. As he cannot perceive himself, this is easily managed. In civilized life, domestic animosity often manifests in innocuous-sounding remarks that, when delivered in a particular tone or context, feel like a blow to the face. To perpetuate this dynamic, you and Glubos must ensure that each of these two individuals holds a sort of double standard. Your patient must insist that all of his utterances be taken at face value and judged solely on their literal meaning while simultaneously evaluating all of his mother's utterances with the most hypersensitive interpretation of tone, context, and perceived intent. She must be encouraged to do the same to him. Thus, from every disagreement, they can both emerge convinced or nearly convinced of their own innocence. You know the scenario. 
I simply inquire about dinner time and she becomes enraged. Once this pattern is firmly established, you have the delightful situation of humans uttering remarks with the explicit intention of causing offense, yet feeling aggrieved when offense is taken. Finally, provide me with information about the old lady's religious stance. Is she at all envious of the new element in her son's life? Does she feel slighted that he should learn from others? And so belatedly, what she believes she offered him ample opportunity to learn in childhood. Does she think he is making a great fuss about it? Or that he's receiving it on excessively favorable terms? Remember the elder brother in the enemy's narrative. In the third letter of the screw tape letters, C.S. Lewis delves into the subtleties of sin within the context of personal and domestic life, revealing how everyday interactions and internal attitudes can become arenas for spiritual conflict. Lewis underscores that sin is not limited to overt, grievous actions like theft or adultery, but often manifests in the ordinary and overlooked aspects of daily life. Lewis highlights how Satan exploits common misunderstandings about sin, particularly the notion that smaller internal missteps, such as jealousy, irritability, or pride, are inconsequential. Yet it is precisely in these areas of thought and attitude where the struggle for moral integrity begins. Screw tape, the experienced tempter, would likely encourage such underestimation of sin to foster complacency and hypocrisy. A significant aspect of this letter involves our interactions with those closest to us. Lewis points out that our spiritual adversaries often push us towards being judgmental of others while ignoring our own faults. This is vividly illustrated through Jesus' admonition about the speck and the plank in Matthew 7. 3. 5. Where the hypocrisy of focusing on others' minor issues while ignoring one's significant shortcomings is condemned. Lewis uses this biblical passage to remind readers that true spiritual clarity comes from self-reflection and correction before critiquing others. Reflecting on his personal experiences, Lewis shares a poignant example from his own life. During World War I, he and his friend Patty Moore made a pact to take care of each other's parents should one of them fall in battle. After Patty's death, Lewis fulfilled this promise by caring for Mrs. Moore for over 30 years. This act of long-term commitment demonstrates Lewis's application of Christian principles in his personal life. Even when faced with challenges such as Mrs. Moore's disapproval of his church attendance post-conversion, this disapproval added another layer to his domestic trials, illustrating the ongoing nature of spiritual tests within personal relationships. Through this letter, Lewis effectively conveys that the spiritual journey involves continual vigilance against both overt and subtle temptations, particularly within the intimate spheres of domestic life and personal thoughts. Letter 4. My dear Wormwood, the amateurish suggestions in your recent letter signaled to me that it is high time for me to address the painful subject of prayer fully. You might have refrained from remarking that my advice regarding his prayers for his mother proved singularly unfortunate. Such comments are not fitting for a nephew to write to his uncle, nor for a junior tempter to the undersecretary of a department. Additionally, it displays an unpleasant inclination to shift responsibility. You must learn to bear the consequences of your own mistakes. The most effective approach, where possible, is to deter the patient from engaging in earnest prayer altogether. When dealing with an adult recently reconverted to the enemy's faction, as in your case, it is best accomplished by encouraging him to recall, or believe he recalls, the mechanical nature of his prayers in childhood. This may lead him to strive for something entirely spontaneous, inward, informal, and irregular. Essentially, an attempt to evoke within himself a vaguely devout mood devoid of genuine willpower and intellect. One of their poets, Coleridge, has noted that he did not pray with moving lips and bended knees, but simply composed his spirit to love and experienced a sense of supplication. This is precisely the type of prayer we desire, and since it bears a superficial resemblance to the prayer of silence practiced by those who are highly advanced in the enemy's service, cunning and indolent patience can be deceived by it for quite some time. At the very least, they can be convinced that their bodily position does not affect their prayers, for they consistently forget what you must always remember that they are animals, and whatever their bodies do impacts their souls. It is amusing how mortals always envision us as implanting thoughts into their minds, 
In reality, our most effective work is accomplished by keeping thoughts out. If this approach fails, resort to a more subtle redirection of his intentions. Whenever they focus on the enemy himself, we are thwarted, but there are methods to prevent them from doing so. The simplest is to divert their attention away from him and towards themselves. Keep them fixated on their own thoughts and attempt to elicit feelings through the exertion of their own willpower. When they intend to request charity from him, let them instead endeavor to manufacture feelings of charity within themselves, without recognizing that this is what they are doing. When they intend to pray for courage, let them actually attempt to feel courageous. When they claim to pray for forgiveness, let them strive to feel forgiven. Teach them to gauge the efficacy of each prayer by their success in eliciting the desired feeling, and never allow them to realize how much success or failure of that kind depends on whether they are in good or poor health, fresh or fatigued at the moment. However, the enemy will not remain idle. Wherever there is prayer, there is the risk of his immediate intervention. He is cynically indifferent to the dignity of his position, as well as ours as pure spirits, and towards human animals on their knees. He reveals self-knowledge in a shameless manner. But even if he thwarts your initial attempt at redirection, we possess a subtler weapon. Humans do not commence prayer from that direct perception of him, which we unfortunately cannot avoid. They have never experienced that ghastly luminosity, that piercing and searing glare which constitutes the backdrop of perpetual agony in our existence. If you delve into your patient's mind while he prays, you will not find that. If you examine the object to which he directs his attention, you will discover that it is a composite entity containing numerous ludicrous elements. There will be images derived from depictions of the enemy as he appeared during the disreputable episode known as the Incarnation. There will be vaguer, perhaps even crude and childish, images associated with the other two persons. There may even be manifestations of his own reverence and accompanying bodily sensations objectified and attributed to the object of reverence. I have encountered cases where what the patient referred to as his God was actually situated up and to the left at the corner of the bedroom ceiling or within his own mind or embodied in a crucifix on the wall. But regardless of the nature of the composite object, you must ensure that he prays to it, to the entity he has fashioned rather than to the person who fashioned him. You may even encourage him to attach great significance to the correction and improvement of his composite object and to maintain its presence in his imagination throughout the entire prayer. For if he ever makes the distinction, if he consciously directs his prayers, not to what I perceive thou art, but to what thou truly art, our situation becomes momentarily dire. Once all his thoughts and images have been discarded, or if retained, retained with a full acknowledgement of their purely subjective nature, and the man entrusts himself to the entirely genuine, external, invisible presence, there with him in the room and unknowable by him as he is known by it, well then, anything is possible. In avoiding this situation, this genuine exposure of the soul in prayer, you will be aided by the fact that humans themselves do not desire it as fervently as they believe. Sometimes one can receive more than they bargain for. In the fourth letter of the Screw Tape Letters, C.S. Lewis tackles the complexities of prayer and the pitfalls of emotional and mental distractions in spiritual practices. He critiques the reliance on achieving a prayerful mood or an emotionally driven devotional state, which he views as vulnerable to demonic misdirection. Lewis illustrates this through Screwtape's guidance to Wormwood on how to manipulate the patient. Screwtape advises fostering an environment where the patient is drawn away from direct communication with God and instead becomes entangled in a jumble of informal, spontaneous thoughts about God and personal feelings. The danger here, as Lewis sees it, is that such a devotional approach can lead to a form of mental idolatry where the feelings about prayer become more important than the prayer itself. For Lewis, the essence of prayer lies not in the emotional experience, but in the deliberate act of addressing God, maintaining a clear and purposeful connection. He values the act of prayer over the feeling of being in a prayerful state, emphasizing that true spiritual value is found in intentional and regular communication with God, regardless of the emotional state. While Lewis acknowledges the role of silent prayer in spiritual life, 
He notes its suitability primarily for those who are spiritually mature. In his later work, Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer, Lewis discusses his own practice of silent prayer, highlighting its challenges and its importance. He describes successful silent prayer as an advanced spiritual exercise that requires one to be at the top of one's form, indicating the level of concentration and spiritual readiness needed. Additionally, Lewis touches on the inherent fears and resistances humans have toward God's presence. He suggests that while Christians may claim to desire God's presence, there is also an underlying fear of truly encountering the divine, reflecting the biblical narrative of Adam and Eve hiding after their sin. This fear and ambivalence provide fertile ground for screw tape and wormwood to exploit as they work to keep the patient from engaging fully and fearlessly with God. Overall, in this letter, Lewis delves deep into the spiritual discipline required for effective prayer, cautioning against allowing emotions or mental images to overshadow the primary goal of direct and intentional communion with God. He underscores the ongoing spiritual battle that involves not only external temptations, but also internal challenges in maintaining a focused and disciplined prayer life. Letter 5. My dear Wormwood, it's somewhat disappointing to anticipate a detailed report on your endeavors and instead receive such a vague outpouring as your last letter. You claim to be delirious with joy because the European humans have initiated another of their wars. I can discern precisely what has transpired with you. You're not delirious, you're simply intoxicated. Reading between the lines of your notably imbalanced account of the patient's sleepless night, I can fairly accurately reconstruct your state of mind. For the first time in your career, you've tasted that wine which is the reward of all our labors, the torment and confusion of a human soul, and it has gone to your head. I can hardly fault you. I do not expect old heads on young shoulders. Did the patient respond to some of your frightful depictions of the future? Did you incorporate some good self-pitying glances at the happy past? Did you elicit some fine thrills in the pit of his stomach? You played your violin skillfully, didn't you? Well, well, it's all quite natural, but do bear in mind, Wormwood, that duty precedes pleasure. If any present self-gratification on your part results in the ultimate loss of the prey, you will be left eternally longing for that draft which you are currently relishing for the first time. Conversely, if by steady and clear-headed effort here and now you can ultimately secure his soul, he will then be yours forever. A brimful living chalice of despair, horror, and astonishment which you can raise to your lips as often as you please. So do not allow any transient excitement to divert you from the true task of undermining faith and hindering the development of virtues. Without fail, provide me in your next letter with a comprehensive account of the patient's reactions to the war so that we may determine whether you are likely to do more good by making him an extreme patriot or an ardent pacifist. There are myriad possibilities. In the meantime, I must caution you not to expect too much from a war. Of course, a war is diverting. The immediate fear and suffering of the humans provide a legitimate and delightful diversion for our countless toiling workers. But what enduring benefit does it confer upon us unless we exploit it to bring souls to our Father below? When I witness the temporal suffering of humans who ultimately escape us, I feel as though I have been permitted to sample the first course of a sumptuous banquet, only to be denied the remainder. It is worse than not having tasted it at all. The enemy, true to his barbaric methods of warfare, allows us to witness the brief misery of his favorites only to tantalize and torment us. To deride the incessant hunger which during this current phase of the great conflict, his blockade is undeniably imposing. Therefore, let us contemplate how to utilize rather than how to enjoy this European war. For it possesses certain inherent tendencies which are, in themselves, by no means favorable to us. We may anticipate a considerable amount of cruelty and unchastity, but if we are not cautious, we may observe thousands turning to the enemy in this tribulation, while tens of thousands who do not go so far as that will nonetheless have their attention diverted from themselves to values and causes which they perceive to be higher than the self. I am aware that the enemy disapproves of many of these causes, but therein lies his unfairness. He frequently claims as prizes humans who have sacrificed their lives for causes he deems unworthy, on the monstrously fallacious grounds that the humans regarded them as virtuous and were following the best they knew. Consider also the undesirable deaths that occur in wartime. 
Men perish in places where they knew they might die, and to which they go if they are at all aligned with the enemy's faction, prepared. How much more advantageous for us if all humans expired in costly nursing homes amidst doctors who lie, nurses who lie, friends who lie, as we have trained them, promising life to the dying, encouraging the belief that illness excuses every indulgence, and even if our workers perform their duties proficiently, withholding all suggestion of a priest, lest it should reveal to the sick man his true condition. And how detrimental for us is the perpetual recollection of death which war imposes. One of our most effective weapons, contented worldliness, is rendered impotent. In wartime, not even a human can entertain the delusion that he will live forever. I am aware that Scabtree and others have perceived in wars a significant opportunity for assaults on faith, but I believe that perspective was overstated. The enemy's human adherents have all been explicitly informed by him that suffering is an essential component of what he terms redemption. Thus, a faith which is shattered by a war or a pestilence cannot genuinely have been worth the trouble of shattering. I am presently referring to diffuse suffering over an extended period, such as the war will engender. Naturally, in moments of terror, bereavement, or physical agony, you may catch your man when his reason is temporarily suspended. Yet even then, if he appeals to enemy headquarters, I have discovered that the post is nearly always defended. In the fifth letter of the screw tape letters, C.S. Lewis confronts the topic of death, providing a sinister perspective on the preferred circumstances of dying from the viewpoint of demons. Screw tape, the senior demon advising his nephew Wormwood, expresses a preference for human deaths that occur in settings like nursing homes where deceit and denial about the reality of death can be cultivated and exploited. Screw tape revels in the idea of humans dying amid falsehoods, surrounded by doctors, nurses, and friends who perpetuate lies about recovery, indulge every whim under the guise of sickness, and avoid any mention of spiritual counsel that might awaken the dying person to their true spiritual state. This strategy is designed to keep individuals from confronting the reality of their mortality and by extension, their accountability in the afterlife. Lewis uses this scenario to critique a societal tendency to avoid discussions of death and the eternal consequences of one's beliefs. He contrasts the quiet, deceptive comfort of a nursing home death with the brutal immediacy of wartime fatalities. In war, individuals often face their mortality directly and may be more open to spiritual reflection and preparation, conditions that Screwtape deems undesirable. Reflecting on his own experiences as a veteran of the First World War and writing during the ongoing conflict of the Second World War, Lewis understood the stark confrontations with death that combatants face. He argues that, despite its horrors, war exposes the unavoidable reality of human mortality, which can lead to deeper spiritual awareness and preparation. This idea resonates with the biblical injunction from Psalm 90:12 which calls on people to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Lewis suggests that by acknowledging the inevitability of death, individuals can live more purposefully and wisely. The letter also touches on personal experiences with death in a more contemporary setting, like hospices, where discussions about faith and eternity can be contentious and unwelcome. Lewis uses these observations to underscore the importance of facing death with a clear understanding of one's beliefs and the consequences they carry into the afterlife. Overall, Letter 5 of the Screw Tape Letters challenges readers to reconsider societal attitudes towards death, encouraging a more open acknowledgement of mortality as a means to spiritual depth and readiness. Letter 6. I am delighted to hear that your patient's age and profession make it possible, but by no means certain, that he will be called up for military service. We want him to be in the maximum uncertainty so that his mind will be filled with contradictory pictures of the future, every one of which arouses hope or fear. There is nothing like suspense and anxiety for barricading a human's mind against the enemy. He wants men to be concerned with what they do. Our business is to keep them thinking about what will happen to them. Your patient will, of course, have picked up the notion that he must submit with patience to the enemy's will. What the enemy means by this is primarily that he should accept with patience the tribulation which has actually been dealt out to him, the present anxiety and suspense. It is about this that he is to say, Thy will be done, and for the daily task of bearing this, 
that the daily bread will be provided. It is your business to see that the patient never thinks of the present fear as his appointed cross, but only of the things he is afraid of. Let him regard them as his crosses. Let him forget that, since they are incompatible, they cannot all happen to him, and let him try to practice fortitude and patience to them all in advance. For real resignation at the same moment to a dozen different and hypothetical fates is almost impossible, and the enemy does not greatly assist those who are trying to attain it. Resignation to present and actual suffering, even where that suffering consists of fear, is far easier and is usually helped by this direct action. An important spiritual law is here involved. I have explained that you can weaken his prayers by diverting his attention from the enemy himself to his own states of mind about the enemy. On the other hand, fear becomes easier to master when the patient's mind is diverted from the thing feared to the fear itself, considered as a present and undesirable state of his own mind. And when he regards the fear as his appointed cross, he will inevitably think of it as a state of mind. One can therefore formulate the general rule, in all activities of mind which favor our cause, encourage the patient to be unselfconscious and to concentrate on the object, but in all activities favorable to the enemy, bend his mind back on itself. Let an insult or a woman's body so fix his attention outward that he does not reflect I am now entering into the state called anger or the state called lust. Contrarywise, let the reflection, my feelings are now growing more devout or more charitable. So fix his attention inward that he no longer looks beyond himself to see our enemy or his own neighbors. As regards his more general attitude to the war, you must not rely too much on those feelings of hatred which the humans are so fond of discussing in Christian or anti-Christian periodicals. In his anguish, the patient can, of course, be encouraged to revenge himself by some vindictive feelings directed towards the German leaders, and that is good so far as it goes but it is usually a sort of melodramatic or mythical hatred directed against imaginary scapegoats. He has never met these people in real life. They are lay figures modeled on what he gets from newspapers. The results of such fanciful hatred are often most disappointing. And of all humans, the English are in this respect the most deplorable milksops. They are creatures of that miserable sort who loudly proclaim that torture is too good for their enemies and then give tea and cigarettes to the first wounded German pilot who turns up at the back door. Do what you will, there is going to be some benevolence as well as some malice in your patient's soul. The great thing is to direct the malice to his immediate neighbors whom he meets every day, and to thrust his benevolence out to the remote circumference, to people he does not know. The malice thus becomes wholly real, and the benevolence largely imaginary. There is no good at all in inflaming his hatred of Germans if, at the same time, a pernicious habit of charity is growing up between him and his mother, his employer, and the man he meets in the train. Think of your man as a series of concentric circles, his will being the innermost, his intellect coming next, and finally his fantasy. You can hardly hope at once to exclude from all the circles everything that smells of the enemy, but you must keep on shoving all the virtues outward till they are finally located in the circle of fantasy and all the desirable qualities inward into the will. It is only in so far as they reach the will and are there embodied in habits that the virtues are really fatal to us. I don't, of course, mean what the patient mistakes for his will, the conscious fume and fret of resolutions and clenched teeth, but the real center, what the enemy calls the heart. All sorts of virtues painted in the fantasy or approved by the intellect or even in some measure, loved and admired, will not keep a man from our father's house. Indeed, they may make him more amusing when he gets there. In letter six of the screw tape letters, C.S. Lewis continues to dissect the complex interplay between a person's will, intellect, and imagination, framing these aspects as concentric circles of being. Screw tape, instructing Wormwood, emphasizes the strategic importance of manipulating these elements to ensure the patient's spiritual downfall. The most inner circle represents the will, surrounded by the intellect, with the imagination or fantasy being the outermost layer. Screwtape's advice to Wormwood is to push virtues outward to the realm of fantasy and to draw desirable qualities inward to the will. By doing so, the virtues become less practical and more abstract, 
reducing their influence on the patient's decisions and actions. Lewis points out that true sins, the ones that have real spiritual consequences, are matters of action influenced by the will, not just by transient feelings or imaginative fantasies. This is why screw tape encourages Wormwood to preoccupy the patient with his emotions and fantasies, diverting his attention from practical godliness and obedience to God. An important aspect of this letter is the distinction screw tape makes about the virtues reaching the will and becoming habits. According to screw tape, it is only when virtues become ingrained habits that they pose a real threat to demonic intentions. Lewis uses this demonic perspective to highlight the importance of habitual godliness and obedience in the present moment, as encapsulated in the notion of saying, Thy will be done, in response to current trials. Moreover, Lewis stresses that while our primary focus in spiritual life should be on actions derived from a trained will, the roles of intellect and fantasy should not be underestimated. These aspects, while less directly influential on the will, shape and inform our moral landscape. Lewis himself, through his vast literary output from the Chronicles of Narnia to mere Christianity, demonstrates the value of engaging both the imagination and the intellect as pathways to understanding deeper spiritual truths. This letter thus serves not only as a tactical guide for Wormwood, but also as a reflection on the holistic nature of human experience where imagination, intellect, and will interact in complex ways to shape our spiritual lives. Lewis underscores the need for vigilance and discipline across all these dimensions to safeguard against spiritual manipulation and to cultivate a life of enduring virtue and obedience to God. Letter 7 My dear Wormwood, I wonder why you should ask me whether it is essential to keep the patient in ignorance of your own existence. That question, at least for the present phase of the struggle, has been answered for us by the High Command. Our policy, for the moment, is to conceal ourselves. Of course, this has not always been the case. We are really faced with a cruel dilemma. When humans disbelieve in our existence, we lose all the pleasing results of direct terrorism and we make no magicians. On the other hand, when they believe in us, we cannot make them materialists and skeptics. At least, not yet. I have great hopes that we shall learn in due time how to emotionalize and mythologize their science to such an extent that what is, in effect, belief in us, though not under that name, will creep in while the human mind remains closed to belief in the enemy. The life force, the worship of sex, and some aspects of psychoanalysis may here prove useful. If once we can produce our perfect work, the materialist magician, the man not using but veritably worshiping what he vaguely calls forces while denying the existence of spirits, then the end of the war will be in sight. But in the meantime, we must obey our orders. I do not think you will have much difficulty in keeping the patient in the dark. The fact that devils are predominantly comic figures in the modern imagination will help you. If any faint suspicion of your existence begins to arise in his mind, suggest to him a picture of something in red tights and persuade him that since he cannot believe in that, it is an old textbook method of confusing them, he therefore cannot believe in you. I had not forgotten my promise to consider whether we should make the patient an extreme patriot or an extreme pacifist. All extremes, except extreme devotion to the enemy, are to be encouraged. Not always, of course, but at this period. Some ages are lukewarm and complacent, and then it is our business to soothe them yet faster asleep. Other ages, of which the present is one, are unbalanced and prone to faction, and it is our business to inflame them. Any small coterie, bound together by some interest which other men dislike or ignore, tends to develop inside itself a hothouse mutual admiration and towards the outer world, a great deal of pride and hatred which is entertained without shame, because the cause is its sponsor and it is thought to be impersonal. Even when the little group exists originally for the enemy's own purposes, this remains true. We want the church to be small, not only that fewer men may know the enemy, but also that those who do may acquire the uneasy intensity and the defensive self-righteousness of a secret society or a clique. The church herself is, of course, heavily defended, and we have never yet quite succeeded in giving her all the characteristics of a faction. But subordinate factions within her have often produced admirable results, from the parties of Paul and of Apollos at Corinth down to the high and low parties in the Church of England.
If your patient can be induced to become a conscientious objector, he will automatically find himself one of a small, vocal, organized, unpopular society, and the effects of this on one so new to Christianity will almost certainly be good. But only almost certainly. Has he had serious doubts about the lawfulness serving in a just war before this present war of serving began? Is he a man of great physical courage, so great that he will have no half-conscious misgivings about the real motives of his pacifism? Can he, when nearest to honesty, no human is ever very near, feel fully convinced that he is actuated wholly by the desire to obey the enemy? If he is that sort of man, his pacifism will probably not do us much good, and the enemy will probably protect him from the usual consequences of belonging to a sect. Your best plan in that case would be to attempt a sudden, confused, emotional crisis from which he might emerge as an uneasy convert to patriotism. Such things can often be managed. But if he is the man I take him to be, try pacifism. Whichever he adopts, your main task will be the same. Let him begin by treating the patriotism or the pacifism as a part of his religion. Then let him, under the influence of partisan spirit, come to regard it as the most important part. Then quietly and gradually nurse him on to the stage at which the religion becomes merely part of the cause, in which Christianity is valued chiefly because of the excellent arguments it can produce in favor of the British war effort or of pacifism. The attitude which you want to guard against is that in which temporal affairs are treated primarily as material for obedience. Once you have made the world an end, in faith a means, you have almost won your man, and it makes very little difference what kind of worldly end he is pursuing. Provided that meetings, pamphlets, policies, movements, causes, and crusades matter more to him than prayers and sacraments and charity, he is ours. And the more religious, on those terms, the more securely ours. I could show you a pretty cageful down here. Letter 7 addresses two main issues, whether demons ought to make their existence known and the dangerous, diabolical temptation to make Christianity a means in service to a cause. Screwtape says that the presence of Satan and demons was common knowledge in ages past, that is, among many cultures throughout much of human history. In the modern age, somewhere around the time of the Enlightenment, the diabolical realm chose to go incognito as a result of naturalism, rationalism, and materialism. Screw tape prefers the modern denial of a spiritual realm because it creates a materialistic worldview and allows for the complete dismissal of God, heaven, hell, angels, and demons. Remember, in much of his writing, Lewis is eager to point to the destructive power of materialism. In this letter, for example, he has screw tape envision what might be called an advanced materialistic option. The materialist magician, the man not using but veritably worshiping, what he vaguely calls forces while denying the existence of spirits. In addition to obscuring the spiritual and accentuating the material, a favorite diabolical strategy is to turn Christianity into a means to some end other than God. The subject under discussion in this letter is patriotism during World War II and whether the patient should be encouraged to be a patriot or a pacifist. Whichever he adopts, your main task will be the same. Let him begin by treating the patriotism or the pacifism as a part of his religion. Then let him, under the influence of partisan spirit, come to regard it as the most important part. Then quietly and gradually nurse him onto the stage at which the religion becomes merely part of the cause in which Christianity is valued chiefly because of the excellent arguments it can produce in favor of the British war effort or of pacifism. The contemporary version of this strategy reveals itself in the discussion of the current moral temperature of the United States. The argument goes that the use of drugs, the decline of the family, the rise of crime, etc., means that what we really need is a spiritual revival, which is true. And here is the diabolical nature of the argument. The true goal and end of a revival, the surrender to the Lordship of Christ and participation in the community of Christ, is subverted into a desire to make America a good place in which to live. It is indisputable that the fruit of conversion produces good citizens and a good society. However, good citizens and a good society are never the goals of conversion. When that happens, a heavenly spiritual goal becomes merely a means of attaining an earthly social goal. As Screwtape says, once you have made the world an end and faith a means, 
you have almost won your man. There is another diabolical strategy mentioned in this letter that is worth pointing out, the push to extremes. Screwtape says, all extremes, except extreme devotion to the enemy, are to be encouraged, especially when the present age is unbalanced and prone to faction, and it is our business to inflame them. Letter 8. My dear Wormwood, so you have great hopes that the patient's religious phase is dying away, have you? I always thought the training college had gone to pieces since they put old Slubgob at the head of it. And now I am sure. Has no one ever told you about the law of undulation? Humans are amphibians, half spirit and half animal. The enemy's determination to produce such a revolting hybrid was one of the things that determined our father to withdraw his support from him. As spirits, they belong to the eternal world, but as animals, they inhabit time. This means that while their spirit can be directed to an eternal object, their bodies, passions, and imaginations are in continual change, for to be in time means to change. Their nearest approach to constancy, therefore, is undulation, the repeated return to a level from which they repeatedly fall back, a series of troughs and peaks. If you had watched your patient carefully, you would have seen this undulation in every department of his life, his interest in his work, his affection for his friends, his physical appetites all go up and down. As long as he lives on earth, periods of emotional and bodily richness and liveliness will alternate with periods of numbness and poverty. The dryness and dullness through which your patient is now going are not, as you fondly suppose, your workmanship. They are merely a natural phenomenon which will do us no good unless you make good use of it. To decide what the best use of it is, you must ask what use the enemy wants to make of it, and then do the opposite. Now it may surprise you to learn that in his efforts to get permanent possession of a soul, he relies on the troughs even more than on the peaks. Some of his special favorites have gone through longer and deeper troughs than anyone else. The reason is this. To us, a human is primarily good. Our aim is the absorption of its will into ours, the increase of our own area of selfhood at its expense. But the obedience which the enemy demands of men is quite a different thing. One must face the fact that all the talk about his love for men and his service being perfect freedom is not, as one would gladly believe, mere propaganda, but an appalling truth. He really does want to fill the universe with a lot of loathsome little replicas of himself, creatures whose life, on its miniature scale, will be qualitatively like his own. Not because he has absorbed them, but because their wills freely conform to his. We want cattle who can finally become food. He wants servants who can finally become sons. We want to suck in. He wants to give out. We are empty and would be filled. He is full and flows over. Our war aim is a world in which our Father below has drawn all other beings into himself. The enemy wants a world full of beings united to him, but still distinct. And that is where the troughs come in. You must have often wondered why the enemy does not make more use of his power to be sensibly present to human souls in any degree he chooses and at any moment. But you now see that the irresistible and the indisputable are the two weapons which the very nature of his scheme forbids him to use. Merely to override a human will, as his felt presence in any but the faintest and most mitigated degree would certainly do, would be for him useless. He cannot ravish. He can only woo. For his ignoble idea is to eat the cake and have it. The creatures are to be one with him, but yet themselves. Merely to cancel them or assimilate them will not serve. He is prepared to do a little overriding at the beginning. He will set them off with communications of his presence which, though faint, seem great to them with emotional sweetness and easy conquest over temptation. But he never allows this state of affairs to last long. Sooner or later he withdraws, if not in fact, at least from their conscious experience, all those supports and incentives. He leaves the creature to stand up on its own legs, to carry out from the will alone duties which have lost all relish. It is during such trough periods, much more than during the peak periods, that it is growing into the sort of creature he wants it to be. Hence the prayers offered in the state of dryness are those which please him best. We can drag our patients along by continual tempting because we design them only for the table, and the more their will is interfered with the better. He cannot tempt to virtue as we do to vice. 
He wants them to learn to walk and must therefore take away his hand. And if only the will to walk is really there, he is pleased even with their stumbles. Do not be deceived, Wormwood. Our cause is never more in danger than when a human, no longer desiring but intending to do our enemy's will, looks round upon a universe from which every trace of him seems to have vanished, and asks why he has been forsaken and still obeys. But of course, the troughs afford opportunities to our side also. Next week, I will give you some hints on how to exploit them. In Letter 7, screw tape encourages thinking in extremes for Wormwood's patient. In Letter 8, he encourages taking advantage of the ups and downs in life. Everyone notices in the course of their spiritual journey that there are emotional phases that vary greatly from one another. One well-known phase is the honeymoon that often follows a teenage or even adult conversion. The sense of release, forgiveness, in the presence of God feels almost intoxicating. Eventually, though, the honeymoon phase gives way to something else, sometimes called the desert phase, one in which there is no sense of the presence of God at all, and the Christian life becomes monotonous. After Mother Teresa of Calcutta died, her personal diary revealed that she had experienced years of such dryness. Lewis is frequently thought of as a great apologist, clearly explaining and defending Christianity. He was also a great spiritual guide. He received thousands of letters from people asking for his advice on how to live the Christian life. He made a commitment to answer every single letter, spending an hour or two each day corresponding with people he had never met, but who had read something he had written and who were looking for spiritual insight and encouragement. Those letters have been compiled and published in books such as Letters to an American Lady, C.S. Lewis, Letters to Children, and Yours, Jack. In Letter 8, Lewis, through screw tape, provides wonderful spiritual guidance for living the normal, mature Christian life. It is normal to experience ups and downs. This is due to what Lewis has screw tape called the law of undulation. If you had watched your patient carefully, you would have seen this undulation in every department of his life. His interest in his work, his affection for his friends, his physical appetites all go up and down. As long as he lives on earth, periods of emotional and bodily richness and liveliness will alternate with periods of numbness and poverty. The dryness and dullness through which your patient is now going are not, as you fondly suppose, your workmanship. They are merely a natural phenomenon which will do us no good unless you make a good use of it. Lewis encourages us to understand that though we might prefer emotionally satisfying periods in our spiritual journeys, it is the dry times, or troughs, according to the law of undulation, that most shape our souls. Screw tape knows the true power of those dry periods. Sooner or later, the enemy withdraws, if not in fact, at least from their conscious experience, all those supports and incentives. He leaves the creature to stand up on its own legs, to carry out from the will alone duties which have lost all relish. It is during such trough periods, much more than during the peak periods, that it is growing into the sort of creature he wants it to be. Hence the prayers offered in the state of dryness are those which please him best. It's good to know, and even a comfort, to know that when our spiritual journey is difficult, God is not absent and will never abandon us. He is always working, however we feel, to shape our souls and conform us to the image of Christ. Letter 9. My dear Wormwood, I hope my last letter has convinced you that the trough of dullness or dryness through which your patient is going at present will not, of itself, give you his soul, but needs to be properly exploited. What forms the exploitation should take I will now consider. In the first place, I have always found that the trough periods of human undulation provide an excellent opportunity for all sensual temptations, particularly those of sex. This may surprise you, because of course there is more physical energy and therefore more potential appetite at the peak periods but you must remember that the powers of resistance are then also at their highest. The health and spirits which you want to use in producing lust can also, alas, be very easily used for work or play or thought or innocuous merriment. The attack has a much better chance of success when the man's whole inner world is drab and cold and empty. And it is also to be noted that the trough sexuality is subtly different in quality from that of the peak, much less likely to lead to the milk and water phenomenon which the humans call being in love, much more easily drawn into perversions, 
much less contaminated by those generous and imaginative and even spiritual concomitants which often render human sexuality so disappointing. It is the same with other desires of the flesh. You are much more likely to make your man a sound drunkard by pressing drink on him as an anodyne when he is dull and weary than by encouraging him to use it as a means of merriment among his friends when he is happy and expansive. Never forget that when we are dealing with any pleasure in its healthy and normal and satisfying form, we are, in a sense, on the enemy's ground. I know we have won many a soul through pleasure. All the same, it is his invention, not ours. He made the pleasures. All our research so far has not enabled us to produce one. All we can do is to encourage the humans to take the pleasures which our enemy has produced at times or in ways or in degrees which he has forbidden. Hence, we always try to work away from the natural condition of any pleasure to that in which it is least natural, least redolent of its maker, and least pleasurable. An ever-increasing craving for an ever-diminishing pleasure is the formula. It is more certain in its better style. To get the man's soul and give him nothing in return, that is what really gladdens our father's heart. And the troughs are the time for beginning the process. But there is an even better way of exploiting the trough. I mean through the patient's own thoughts about it. As always, the first step is to keep knowledge out of his mind. Do not let him suspect the law of undulation. Let him assume that the first ardors of his conversion might have been expected to last and ought to have lasted forever, and that his present dryness is an equally permanent condition. Having once got this misconception well fixed in his head, you may then proceed in various ways. It all depends on whether your man is of the desponding type who can be tempted to despair or of the wishful thinking type who can be assured that all is well. The former type is getting rare among the humans. If your patient should happen to belong to it, everything is easy. You have only got to keep him out of the way of experienced Christians, an easy task nowadays, to direct his attention to the appropriate passages in Scripture and then to set him to work on the desperate design of recovering his old feelings by sheer willpower, and the game is ours. If he is of the more hopeful type, your job is to make him acquiesce in the present low temperature of his spirit and gradually become content with it, persuading himself that it is not so low after all. In a week or two, you will be making him doubt whether the first days of his Christianity were not perhaps a little excessive. Talk to him about moderation in all things. If you can once get him to the point of thinking that religion is all very well up to a point, you can feel quite happy about his soul. A moderated religion is as good for us as no religion at all, and more amusing. Another possibility is that of direct attack on his faith. When you have caused him to assume that the trough is permanent, can you not persuade him that his religious phase is just going to die away, like all his previous phases? Of course there is no conceivable way of getting by reason from the proposition, I am losing interest in this, to the proposition, this is false. But as I said before, it is jargon, not reason, you must rely on. The mere word phase will very likely do the trick. I assume that the creature has been through several of them before. They all have. And that he always feels superior and patronizing to the ones he has emerged from. Not because he has really criticized them, but simply because they are in the past. You keep him well fed on hazy ideas of progress and development and the historical point of view, I trust, and give him lots of modern biographies to read. The people in them are always emerging from phases, aren't they? You see the idea? Keep his mind off the plain antithesis between true and false. Nice shadowy expressions. It was a phase, Ah. Uh, I've been through all that. And don't forget the blessed word adolescent. In Letter 9, Lewis through Screw Tape continues as a spiritual guide, helping us navigate life's spiritual phases. On one hand, he makes it clear that the demons want to encourage extremes, for us to either be really up or really down, according to the law of undulation. Each phase in the temperament of each patient can be exploited by the demons. When we are up, we are vulnerable to lust and inappropriate expressions of sensual pleasure. When we are down, we are in danger of discouragement and even giving up on the faith. However, the attack has a much better chance of success when the man's whole inner world is drab and cold and empty. On the other hand, while extremes, from the tempter's perspective, are to be encouraged, the tempter advocates moderation as well, a very special type of moderation. 
Talk to him about moderation in all things. If you can once get him to the point of thinking that religion is all very well up to a point, you can feel quite happy about his soul. A moderated religion is as good for us as no religion at all, and more amusing. The demons are adept at twisting things. Life's ups and downs clearly make us targets for temptation or the loss of faith. But even moderation can be used to make us spiritually dull. Jesus even warns against it, telling the church at Laodicea that because they were lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, he was about to spit them out of his mouth. Reverend 3, 16. Another issue to be considered involves pleasure. While the demons tempt us with pleasure, Wormwood must never forget that when we are dealing with any pleasure in its healthy and normal and satisfying form, we are, in a sense, on the enemy's ground. I know we have won many a soul through pleasure. All the same, it is his invention, not ours. He made the pleasures. All our research so far has not enabled us to produce one. All we can do is to encourage the humans to take the pleasures which our enemy has produced, at times, or in ways, or in degrees, which he has forbidden. After Mrs. Moore died in 1951, Lewis was delivered from a life burden and found his life to be rather pleasant and easygoing. During that period, he wrote to a friend saying, Pray for me. He knew that there were temptations and spiritual dangers, even in the best of times. Letter 10. My dear Wormwood, I was delighted to hear from Trip Twees that your patient has made some very desirable new acquaintances, and that you seem to have used this event in a really promising manner. I gather that the middle-aged married couple who called at his office are just the sort of people we want him to know. Rich, smart, superficially intellectual, and brightly skeptical about everything in the world. I gather they are even vaguely pacifist, not on moral grounds, but from an ingrained habit of belittling anything that concerns the great mass of their fellow men and from a dash of purely fashionable and literary communism. This is excellent, and you seem to have made good use of all his social, sexual, and intellectual vanity. Tell me more. Did he commit himself deeply? I don't mean in words. There is a subtle play of looks and tones and laughs by which a mortal can imply that he is of the same party as those to whom he is speaking. That is the kind of betrayal you should specially encourage, because the man does not fully realize it himself, and by the time he does, you will have made withdrawal difficult. No doubt he must very soon realize that his own faith is in direct opposition to the assumptions on which all the conversation of his new friends is based. I don't think that matters much provided that you can persuade him to postpone any open acknowledgement of the fact, and this with the aid of shame, pride, modesty, and vanity will be easy to do. As long as the postponement lasts, he will be in a false position. He will be silent when he ought to speak and laugh when he ought to be silent. He will assume, at first only by his manner, but presently by his words, all sorts of cynical and skeptical attitudes, which are not really his. But if you play him well, they may become his. All mortals tend to turn into the thing they are pretending to be. This is elementary. The real question is how to prepare for the enemy's counterattack. The first thing is to delay as long as possible the moment at which he realizes this new pleasure as a temptation. Since the enemy's servants have been preaching about the world as one of the great standard temptations for 2,000 years, this might seem difficult to do. But fortunately, they have said very little about it for the last few decades. In modern Christian writings, though I see much, indeed more than I like, about Mammon, I see few of the old warnings about worldly vanities, the choice, of friends, and the value of time. All that your patient would probably classify as Puritanism. And may I remark in passing that the value we have given to that word is one of the really solid triumphs of the last hundred years. By it, we rescue annually thousands of humans from temperance, chastity, and sobriety of life. Sooner or later, however, the real nature of his new friends must become clear to him and then your tactics must depend on the patient's intelligence. If he is a big enough fool, you can get him to realize the character of the friends only while they are absent. Their presence can be made to sweep away all criticism. If this succeeds, he can be induced to live, as I have known many humans live, for quite long periods, two parallel lives. He will not only appear to be, but actually be, a different man in each of the circles he frequents. 
Failing this, there is a subtler and more entertaining method. He can be made to take a positive pleasure in the perception that the two sides of his life are inconsistent. This is done by exploiting his vanity. He can be taught to enjoy kneeling beside the grocer on Sunday just because he remembers that the grocer could not possibly understand the urbane and mocking world which he inhabited on Saturday evening. And contrarywise, to enjoy the body and blasphemy over coffee with these admirable friends, all the more because he is aware of a deeper spiritual world within him which they cannot understand. You see the idea, the worldly friends touch him on one side and the grocer on the other, and he is the complete, balanced, complex man who sees round them all. Thus, while being permanently treacherous to at least two sets of people, he will feel, instead of shame, a continual undercurrent of self-satisfaction. Finally, if all else fails, you can persuade him, in defiance of conscience, to continue the new acquaintance on the ground that he is, in some unspecified way, doing these people good by the mere fact of drinking their cocktails and laughing at their jokes, and that to cease to do so would be priggish, intolerant, and, of course, puritanical. Meanwhile, you will, of course, take the obvious precaution of seeing that this new development induces him to spend more than he can afford and to neglect his work and his mother. Her jealousy and alarm and his increasing evasiveness or rudeness will be invaluable for the aggravation of the domestic tension. Letter 10 explores a new dimension of spiritual warfare, social relationships. The patient has just been introduced to a new social set just the sort of people that PBS and British TV love to show as the Oxford-Cambridge set of the 1940s and 50s, privileged, upper-class intellectual snobs who love to use cutting, snide humor. Screwtape describes them as rich, smart, superficially intellectual, and brightly skeptical about everything in the world. I gather they are even vaguely pacifist, not on moral grounds, but from an ingrained habit of belittling anything that concerns the great mass of their fellow men and from a dash of purely fashionable and literary communism. The very arrogant attitude of such people is infectious and corrupting. The danger is social pressure, the desire to be approved of by the in-crowd, which leads to adopting attitudes and actions that are ungodly and therefore diabolical. Added to the spiritual danger is hypocrisy, in which the patient acts one way with his snobby friends and another way when he is around the Christian community. Screwtape explains this to Wormwood. You see the idea. The worldly friends touch him on one side and the grocer on the other, and he is the complete, balanced, complex man who sees round them all. Thus, while being permanently treacherous to at least two sets of people, he will feel, instead of shame, a continual undercurrent of self-satisfaction. This theme of dangerous and destructive social pressure is one that Lewis addresses on several occasions. His essay entitled The Inner Ring, for example, sounds the alarm against social pressure. Unless you take measures to prevent it, this desire is going to be one of the chief motives of your life, from the first day on which you enter your profession until the day you are too old to care. He expands upon this theme in several of his fictional works. In The Silver Chair, Eustace Scrub discovers Jill Pole crying, Jill was running from them, the inner ring of bullies who controlled her school's social structure. Together, Jill and Eustace escape into Narnia and begin their adventures. In that hideous strength, Mark Studdick, an aspiring academic at a fictional college that feels a lot like Oxford or Cambridge, falls under the spell of an inner ring. Through their influence and his hunger to be in the inner circle, Mark is drawn deeper and deeper into a dark, diabolical plot. Another comment of note in this letter is Screwtape's dictum, all mortals turn into the thing they are pretending to be. Lewis sees this as a powerful principle for good and for ill. In mere Christianity, he suggests that those of us who desire to grow spiritually, even if we don't feel very holy or righteous, should pretend that we are anyway. For if we do this, eventually our play acting will become a reality. Lewis explains, do not waste time bothering whether you love your neighbor. Act as if you did. As soon as we do this, we find one of the great secrets. When you are behaving as if you love someone, you will presently come to love him. If you injure someone you dislike, you will find yourself disliking him more. Lewis here is functioning as our spiritual guide. Again, he wants us to know that choosing to do what is right, whether we feel like it or not, shapes our souls in ways that are conforming us to the image of Christ.